the Bike Lock Attacker's lawyer, incited a riot in the 60s. Dan Siegel, communist, Antifa, BIMN, and domestic terrorist. In this video, we will uncover dirt on Dan Siegel, attorney for Eric Clanton, allegedly the Bike Lock Attacker from the Antifa and BIMN domestic terrorist crowd, including his involvement in violent activism, communism, and domestic terrorism. Hold on to your seats, folks. It's about to get weird. If your client goes to jail, will, be the, will this be the first time he moves out of his parents' house? No, 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 This is assault with a deadly weapon. This is a follow-up to our video, Antifa Lawyer Owned Repeatedly, The Power of Laughter. But if you don't want to watch that video, I will quickly explain. This guy hit people over the head with a U-shaped bicycle lock on April 15th in Berkeley, California. Volunteers set about uncovering his identity to bring him to justice, and made a strong case that the bike lock attacker is Eric Clanton. Their case was strong enough for the police to apprehend him, but he went on the run. They did find him, and he was arrested. This man, Dan Siegel, is representing him pro bono. At a press briefing the other day, Dan Siegel was repeatedly owned by people of various ethnic backgrounds who he slandered and said were racists. In this video, we will take a closer look at who this Dan Siegel is and other neat stuff with Tabitha. Unfortunately, I very often forget to use phrases like it is reported that or allegedly or according to sources so please understand if i say something is true i don't really mean that it's true i mean that according to sources it's true as far as i know so please understand that if i say something is true i really should have said it is reported that or something like that now don't get us wrong folks we understand the importance of being innocent unless proven guilty that is a crucial principle Although Antifa and BIMN don't believe in that principle, we do. And everybody's entitled to a fair trial, even Eric Clanton. And we still don't know if Eric Clanton is actually the bike lock attacker. It seems very likely that he is, but we just don't know that for sure. And yes, Dan Siegel is just doing his job. Or is he? Is it really a lawyer's job to lie and deceive and smear people? No, no it's not. That is not part of his job. And by doing such things, it's clear that he's driven by an ideological bias, not by any sense of justice. As a lawyer, you can do your job and you can serve justice by defending somebody who is to be considered to be innocent unless proven guilty without lying and smearing people like Dan Siegel did, as we saw in my first video on this. So. He's not just doing his job, he's acting as a cancer cell in the social body. Let's look into Dan Siegel. Let's start with Wikipedia. And don't be one of those people, oh, Wikipedia is not a good source. People who say that don't understand how to look into citations and references. It all comes down to this. If a claim is made on Wikipedia, is it well supported with the evidence or not? So it's a good starting point, but it should certainly not be the end of your search. And if you're in college, you should never use Wikipedia as a source, just as a means to find sources. So as Wikipedia says, Daniel Mark Siegel is a civil rights attorney at the Oakland-based law firm Siegel & Yee, 
former legal advisor to Oakland Mayor Gene Kwan, and candidate in the 2014 Oakland mayoral race. He specializes in employment and labor law. Skipping ahead a bit, under student activism, it says that Siegel was a student activist from 1967 to 1970 when he attended UC Berkeley's University of California Berkeley Law School, and that he was a leader in the local Students for a Democratic Society. Now, it seems he's involved with the famous Bloody Thursday. If you're anything like me, you've seen a lot of videos about the 60s and the Civil Rights Movement and what was going on in Berkeley at that time, and you may be familiar with Bloody Thursday. You may have seen this footage, for example. Students and hippies and stuff took over a local park, they renamed it People's Park, and started developing it for the town. You see, the local college bought the park from the city, so it was theirs, and they were using it as sort of an unofficial parking lot. It was run down, and while well, the students felt that it could be put to better use. Now, I sort of lean towards the whole hippie thing myself. I think I have that kind of a bias. But in all actuality, legally speaking, the park did not belong to the city or to the people. It belonged to the college. So the students basically took over what is private property. On May 15th, 1969, Siegel was at People's Park and he noticed there were police taking over the park. Fences were being put up to keep people out. So he went over to Sprawl Plaza where there was a rally with a bunch of students. He took control of the microphone. The following is a good example of how Wikipedia can be policed by other people. Yesterday, this section on Siegel said, Siegel received the microphone as a crowd of 3,000 agitated to reclaim their community space when he yelled, take the park. A riot ensued that ended with authorities firing at demonstrators, killing one. Notice it says, weasel words. So why does it say that? Well, because there is language that is misleading in that sentence. If you click on the citation markers, that is the number three and the number four, it gives you the sources from which this information was taken. If you read those sources, you see that this sentence is intellectually dishonest. So this has been revised to read more accurately as, During a rally on Sprawl Plaza on that day, May 15th, 1969, Siegel received the microphone as a crowd of 3,000 agitated to reclaim what was perceived as their community space when he yelled, take the park. I have a suggestion. Let's go down to the people's park. They were highway patrol officers all around the park and people were putting a fence up. Dan Siegel is an attorney and president of the Oakland School Board, but back in 1969, he was UC Berkeley's student body president. At his speech at Sproul Hall that day, he urged the 4,000 people there to take back the park. People then started to drift down Telegraph Avenue towards People's Park. Uh, they ran into the police barricade, set up a telegraph and haste. Uh, some people threw some rocks or bottles. The police started throwing tear gas, and then the riot was on. Not long after, police start firing buckshot and tear gas. One student is killed and an estimated 128 people are admitted to local hospitals. James Rector was shot and killed. Another man was blinded. We thought the cops were totally outrageous, uh, definitely deserved being called pigs. In the end, 169 people were injured, including dozens of law enforcement officers, more than 1,000 arrested. But here I was, uh, right in the middle of this event, uh, accused of inciting to riot. Siegel stood trial on that charge and was acquitted. Scrolling down a bit, we read under State Bar of California controversy that upon receiving his JD degree from the University of California School of Law in 1970 and passing the California Bar Examination, Siegel was denied a license to practice law by a subcommittee of the State Bar of California. According to the Long Beach Independent, his admittance to the bar was denied on moral grounds because he allegedly, quote, advocated violence and the seizure of property and lie when he denied advocating those things, unquote. Earlier in the year, he had been charged with inciting a riot, but had charges dismissed due to a lack of evidence. That little bit right there is cited to Long Beach Independent, December 1st, 1972. It says Siegel and his lawyer Malcolm Bernstein appealed the subcommittee's decision, taking his appeal to the California Supreme Court, which overruled the state bar and found that Siegel possessed the requisite, quote, moral character, unquote, to practice law. And that is based on the Supreme Court of California, 1973, October 9th. Siegel v. Committee of Bar Examiners, 10, California, 3, blah, blah, blah. You see there, you know. Hold on, wait a minute. I think Dan Siegel was in the Communist Workers' Party. Oh, really? Yep, not surprising. It seems that Dan Siegel may have been a chairman for a communist organization in the 80s. 
The Communist Workers' Party is, or was, an organization that subscribed to Maoism, Leninism, and Stalinism. Wow. The Communist Workers' Party apparently started in 1973, and it was involved in the famous Greensboro Massacre of 1979. That was those folks. They made some very clear public threats to physically harm members of the KKK, and they held a Death to the Klan march, wherein they clashed with members of the KKK and the American Nazi Party. On November 3rd, the, uh, the group had begun to gather for the anti-Klan demonstration, and there were sort of several clusters of people so hanging around in the area of the community center there. And it was a very weird thing. Several people mentioned there's no cops. Sandy mentioned that, I remember. Because uh, every demonstration we have, I mean, it's like uh, we have our own personal police force. These cops are on our, are on our case all the time. So uh, it was uh, highly unusual not to have uh, police just crawling all over the place. Shortly after 11, from uh, down at Willow Road, a Klan caravan, you know, pulled on the street. Death to the Klan! Death to the Klan! Death to the Klan! And this fella in the uh, front car looked very familiar. I'd seen him at the police station. It's pretty weird. I later came to know this was Dawson, a Klansman who had been given our permit by the Greensboro police without us being notified. A man with a long barrel pistol, he, he leaned out of the window of the vehicle in front and he fired it at about a 45 degree angle in the air. When I turned around, all of these people, as if a single signal had been given, lunged out of their cars in the vehicle. There were people laying every place. Caesar was, um, you know, really charged them, took a lot of bullets. There was a huge puddle of blood around Mike. Mike had been hit, flushed in the we face. Call, we call. Uh, the shotgun. It was, uh, it was the most gruesome of all. The very first person I got to was Sandy Smith. Blood was pouring from a hole in her head, and her eyes were open, and she had been shot between the eyes. Jim was uh, laying face down, and I tried to talk to him. Then I saw the bullet hole in his back. So uh, I got up and ran back out here, and uh, still there weren't any policemen here. and the state got together and planned this. That's why there were not, no cops here. Do you hear me? The state protects the Klan, and this makes it clear. They came through and they opened fire. They opened fire on us. Five of the members were killed by the bullets and several others were injured. Now, it should go without saying that we have no sympathies with the Klan, and of course, we sympathize with the victims of that massacre. And in fact, it does seem that those people were killed because the police, number one, let the KKK know where the rally was to take place, and number two, held back, did not do their job, and were not at the scene, and therefore those people were killed. They were killed because of the ideology of the establishment in that place and time. And notice the irony, or the hypocrisy of the fact that Dan Siegel was co-chairman of the group that had its members killed that day. And now, he's representing a person who committed multiple acts of attempted murder at another rally, and was able to do so because the police held back and were not doing their job because of the ideology of the establishment in that time and place. So it goes to show you folks, if you abandon principles and the rule of law, that pendulum can swing from left to right 
It can victimize the right in one case, victimize the left in another case, and of course, it's much wiser to actually adhere to principles in an unbiased, impartial manner. But for some reason, this is an alien idea to millennials, and to those who know better but play on their whims for their own political careers. And of course, people being hit over the head with a bike lock and surviving is not the same as people dying from gunshot wounds. However, it's the principle that I'm pointing to here. In 1985, at least apparently, the Communist Workers' Party renamed themselves the New Democratic Movement. According to this key wiki, Dan Siegel was one of three co-chairmen for the party in 1986. The article offers photos of this document as evidence, but unfortunately there's no way of knowing the veracity of this. The photo is just posted with no source. If I had more time, I would look into this further, but sorry, I can't spend any more time on that. Maybe in the future I can look through issues of, say, their newsletter and other sources, but that's enough now. Of course, there are links to all these sources in the video description below. By the way, also in the video description is a link to an article by Dan Siegel titled, New China Will Be Read and Expert. Notice the words red and expert in that title. The Communist Workers' Party apparently had an internal bulletin titled The Expert Red. So, if Dan Siegel was indeed one of the co-chairmen of this organization, that would link him to yet another organization that legitimizes the use of violence for political aim. Yeah, 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 Of course we have no sympathies with the KKK or the American Nazi Party, the two groups that clashed with the Communist Workers Party on that day, but notice the trend here. Yet again, we have a communist organization just calling for violence, really making no qualms about calling for violence and going on a march and then clashing with, at first, actual KKK and neo-Nazis. Later on, however, they tend to turn on just regular people. And the reason that these communist douchebags keep going after regular citizens is because regular citizens think like you and me and know that you are not allowed to put your fucking hands on a complete goddamn stranger. Right. And yet again, here we notice, just like uh, last year at Sacramento, we have this communist organization going up against real racists, actually getting bloodied, in their case six died, right? And then going, ah. Oh, well, that was hard. Let's just call regular people KKK uh -huh. members and go against them. Exactly, because now they're, they're too fucking bitch-ass to go against real ones. And the thing is, is that they just need to fuck off. <laughs> I'm sorry. This will never be a communist nation, you fucking dingbats. <laughs> right. And the thing is, like I briefly mentioned earlier, these are not even people who are like, oh, real communism has never been tried. Stalinism wasn't real communism. Maoism wasn't. No, these people, the Communist Worker Party, they specifically embrace the views of Stalinism, Leninism, and Maoism. Mm -hmm. Now, these people say Nazism is bad. They're absolutely right. Uh, and one of those is because the Nazis killed about 11 million people, right? But combine Maoism, Stalinism, and Leninism, you have over a hundred million people dead. Yeah, their hypocrisy knows no bounds. So these people are that much no worse bounds. than the Nazis. Yeah, their hypocrisy knows no bounds. You know, and I, the reason I think that they go after what they proclaim to be Nazis so much... Yes? ...is because it's a competing faction for power. Exactly. It's like the World War II era. You have the communists versus the Nazis, and then you have good people. Yeah, As the rest of us. <laughs> oh, but you're going to run a country. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Can't even fucking govern themselves. But they, they're so sure that they will. Nope, they're just like every other communistic piece of shit out there. We'll do better than everybody else, and then... Begging other countries to come in and save them? Oh, and speaking of which, here's an article by Dan Siegel. Is it time to dissolve the Oakland Police Department? 
Yeah, well, I'm not going to read this whole long thing, but he seems to be arguing the usual communist anarchist drivel of, we don't need police and government, we'll just have people from the community who will police and govern. Yeah. So, near the end of the article, and listen to this, Tabitha, quote, we do not pretend to have the answers to these issues. Whether we have a chance of success depends in large part on our ability to build a mass movement. Mm. Where have we heard these words Dismiss before? The militant part. Yeah, just include militant, and we have the mantra that we've heard from Yvette Falarka many times. That's what building a mass militant movement takes. BAMS, our method is to build a mass militant, integrated, anti-racist and immigrant rights movement, and to do that and getting as many people as possible to take militant mass direct action. BAM is building and leading a movement that's committed to building militant, integrated, direct action to shut them down by any means necessary. By any means necessary. We've got to build a movement in this nation. And the, the mass militant action. And we need to keep building this movement. This is about building a militant integrated movement that's independent, organizes masses of people, and takes militant direct action to yes. I thought it was a beautiful sight. Our ability to build a mass movement that unites the black and brown communities, working people, and progressive activists. I've been part of the progressive uh, political movement in Oakland, Berkeley area since I got here in 1967. Progressive uh, or regressive? I'm progressive activists. To begin, I would like to pose some questions and promote a dialogue to answer them. One, what sort of organization should be developed to secure public safety in urban communities like Oakland? Well, gee, I don't know. Maybe the police? I mean, granted, the police, they're often corrupt. Granted, the police are often violent. Granted, the police, unfortunately, are given IQ tests. If it turns out that they're too independent of a thinker or too intelligent, then they won't hire them as a police person. So granted, yes, there needs to be police reform. But uh, just taking away the police and then going to the community and then starting over again? Come on. But it's the same story we've heard over and over again. We don't need police. We don't need government. People can live in peace. As they stomp on people, they say these things. Oh, we don't need them. We just replace them with members of our community. Yeah, you mean people that join lynch mobs like yours? Fuck you. Now, I would love for there to be peaceful anarchism, people living in tribal communalism and all that kind of stuff. But it's people like Antifa and BAMN that make that impossible. Yeah. Okay? And not just extremists on their side, the competing extremists that are out there somewhere in, like, you know, Kentucky or whatever. You know, all violent people. But specifically, these people who say, we need anarchism and communism, we don't need government, and blah, blah, blah. They are the reason why we do need police and government yeah. to protect us from people like that. Otherwise, we'd be living in, you know, that movie, The Purge. Yeah. All year round. Which is what they want. They, they idolize that fucking movie. They fucking idolize what is technically a slasher horror film. Yeah. And Tabby's not just making this up. She studies these people's interests online. Yes, most of them love Charles Manson and other various fucking serial killers. They this want is... the Bloods and the Crips in their ranks, by the way. Yeah. These people are deranged. They don't need power. They need to be locked the fuck up. They are the reason why I say never allow people who want power over other people to have power over other people. Yeah, these are the same people that, that in their the comments or posts that they make, they talk about lining people up and mowing them down. Mm-hmm. Why? Not because they're Nazis. No, there's nothing of that in the comments. It's because... They're Republicans. Right. That's all it takes is to be on the other side. And you deserve to get a bullet. And they're not designating who's getting lined up. Men, women, children, the elderly. Mm -hmm. These pieces of shit want to take over. Siegel represents these pieces of shit.
you know, Dan Siegel, he can really dance. So let's forgive him. <laughs> Here he is in a campaign commercial for when he ran for mayor. Oh, God. Mayor of Oakland. <laughs> mayor of Oakland. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, he ran for the mayor of Oakland in 2014. And this reminds me of why I say never let people who want power to have power. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if somebody wants a political position, you should immediately be like, well, let's stop them. Right. <laughs> There's a reason they want it. We shouldn't want them to do that. It should be more like jury duty, like, Sorry, buddy, you're qualified, we all voted, and we know you don't want to do it, but you're the best person for the job, so, yeah, you know, so sir okay. or ma'am, we're sorry, but you have the job now. Yep. <laughs> now, let's take a look at his Facebook. Oh, will you take a look at this? Here he is in the BAM Facebook group. Ah. Let's take a look at his Facebook friends list. Near the top, who do we see? The mayor of Berkeley. And City Councilman Chris Worthington. Now, what does it mean when people are at the tops of other people's friends lists? When you're at the top quarter, okay, that means you're having more activity with those people. And the closer to the top of the list, the more activity you have. Like, the more of their things that you like, the more times you message each other, so on and so forth. So, if they're at the top of his friends list, that's because there's a lot of communication or activity between profiles happening there. And as you noticed before the media did, both the mayor, uh, Jesse, and Chris Worthington, the city council guy there, they're both uh, in BAM, B-A-M-N. Mm -hmm. They're in the groups. They're active in the groups. They're also active with Yvette Falarca, one of the leaders of B-A-M-N. Yep. And they're there you go. All corrupt together. If I wasn't blocked by Yvette Falarca, I would not be surprised if this Dan Siegel is also active with her. Oh, I looked. He's not. Ah. He's smart enough not to be on her friends list. I see. But is on the friends list of two of her cohorts, plus being an active member of the BAM group itself, which Yvette Falarka is in. Yeah. So it's an underhanded way of communicating with her without getting caught actually communicating with her. Okay. Seeing as how the mayor got caught that way. So he probably jumped ship along... Or, shortly after the mayor got caught because the mayor has also jumped ship. So he's in the BAMN group. He's friends with the mayor and other politicians uh, who are also friends with Yvette Florica and the, in the BAMN group. As you've noticed before the media did, even if the uh, mayor tries to remove himself from the group, we, we can be pretty sure that he still is communicating with those people anyway. And here we have the lawyer for Eric Clanton, who is allegedly the, well, what people call the Antifa by Glock attacker, but which you are saying is probably BAMN. It seems likely. It seems more clues that we put together here. You know, uh, it, it seems like it. Yeah. And the thing is that these people, they can always play this game of, well, there's no official membership of Antifa or BAMN. Yeah, we all know. Well, so no we're judging you by your actions and your affiliations. Exactly. See, we're actually judging you by the way you act. Unlike you idiots who are just <laughs> judging anybody that you don't like to be a Nazi. Oh, I don't like you, so you're a Nazi. Yeah. Not that any of us have ever done anything to be proven a Nazi. It's just part of their perceived reality that is so uh -huh. important that it's being pushed in colleges these days, this misunderstanding of postmodernism, mm -hmm. that there's no objective reality, that perceived reality is all that there is, and blah 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 blah. So we have the city of Berkeley being hauled into court for their violation of civil liberties and their protection of Antifa and BAMN unlawfully. Mm -hmm. And then we have this guy who's in bed with those people doing the same thing for somebody who is either a member of BAMN, Antifa, both, whatever, however you want to look at it, mm -hmm. but basically on their side. And you got the mayors, you got the lawyers, so on and so forth, all in bed with these domestic terrorist communist organizations. Mm -hmm. They're proud to be using violence to counter speech that they don't like. Well, any speech that's logical and pro-America. They don't want America to be how it is now. They want it to be a communistic nation. But how can you have that when people keep speaking logic? Right. So what do you have to do? Silence the logic. Yeah. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to turn anyone who speaks truth into a fucking Nazi 
so that everybody will go, oh my god, there's fucking Nazis everywhere, you can't believe anything, we all have to become communists so that we can weed out all these Nazis! Yeah, so it's the whole, yes, we're in a crisis, so please save us, big brother, please take away some of our freedoms, mm -hmm. and give us more security. Now, we just discussed the uh, People's Park incident. The first thing on his page today is an article about that event. Mm -hmm. So he, apparently he's not ashamed. No. Of He's taking proud part. of himself. Yeah. Okay, so on February 24th, 2017, Dan Siegel posted the following in his own words, quote, Every day that we gather to protest the status quo and demand change, but do not organize ourselves to build a movement. This is about building a militant integrated movement. That, that fights, fights for, for the, the power. power basically, we need. the upper hand. Yeah. Fights <laughs> for the power that we need. To create radical change is a waste of of our energy and a gift to our enemies. And radical change, when used in this context, the radical means extreme and or violent, a force change. So what's being said here in a very covert way is we need people who will assemble and commit to acts of violence to force our agenda. Yeah, because what what is... What more do you do than organize and protest peacefully? If you're well, saying we need to do more than that, well, what more can you do? Exactly. That's violence. what I mean. He's advocating for violence. And then he has a hashtag on his page, too, that when you go and look at it, it's nothing but hate. It's a hashtag for people expressing anger, one, either toward themselves, other people, or another race. Hashtag fuck around if you want to. Okay, mm -hmm. let's check out hashtag fuck around if you want to. See. Oh, I see. It's a trending hashtag put out by a lot of people. Let's see. Uh, racism. Yeah. It's like, the thing is, is that to post this hashtag without first researching it would be stupid. Because this is a hashtag where people are expressing their extreme anger. Or are just being advocates for violence. Or are just hate speeching against another fucking race. And yet he posts the hashtag not once, but twice on his page. So you go to the first one, it doesn't go anywhere because the whole thing has been removed because of how fucking violent this shit is. Yeah, so it seems like this Dan Siegel, he, he advocates for violence, but he, you know, he doesn't go, he doesn't take that step into actually saying it so that he can get himself in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. So he's like skirting on the gray area of calling for violence. Exactly. So who the hell is this guy? To be like, you people engage in hate speech. You people engage in hate speech. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, once again, you are exactly what you accuse others of being. Exactly. How often do I have to say that? Ugh. It's anyway. Just, it's disgusting. He is a, a giant piece of walking shit. At some point, somebody, at one point, somebody who follows his Facebook page goes, I'm wondering, has your Facebook been hacked? Because he's becoming more and more aggressively violent right. in his speech and in the things that he posts. And right. the people who have been following him while he was silent are beginning to wonder, has he lost his fucking mind or has he been hacked? And he said himself, no, I haven't been hacked. He's, he, that's, this is who he is. He's a nutball who wants violence, but at the same time wants to say that it's okay so long as it's the violence that he approves of. Right. Which is not okay. Uh, huh? Pop, pop! Wow. So there you have it, folks. Dan Siegel, lawyer for Eric Clanton, allegedly the bike lock attacker, has been into violent activism since the 60s, is allegedly a co-chairman of the Communist Workers' Party, is in bed with other corrupt politicians who are also in bed with domestic terrorists, communism, BAMN, Antifa, and so on. And apparently his entire approach is to say, those people are racist, so it's okay to try to MURDER THEM! Well, fuck you Dan Siegel, fuck you Antifa, fuck you BAMN, 
Fuck you, Mayor Jesse Aragon, and all you other communist, domestic, terrorist politicians out there in California. Fuck you all. You're all going down. Thanks for watching, folks. Please subscribe to our channel. Please click that little bell icon. Please subscribe to me at Minds.com, Gab, Twitter, Vimeo, etc. See the links in the description below. And please stay tuned for our next video where we woman explain that press briefing and have a lot of fun at Dan Siegel's expense. Thanks again for watching. Peace, love, freedom, and equality.